just like family and just like friends and taking care of your loved ones when you're gone is a priority for all of us, we should also be thinking about taking care of our books. Welcome to the Authorpreneur Secrets Podcast. My name is C. Ruth Taylor, and this is a program that gives you the roadmap to take charge of your publishing with stories and strategies to dominate authorpreneurship. Coming up in today's show, we are going to be discussing author estate management. And with me today is our third non-Caribbean guest. He is the author of over 80 books of science fiction and fantasy and self-help books for authors. Last I counted, it was 29 self-help books for authors under the series Advice for Authors. He has a popular YouTube channel called Author Level Up with approximately 40,000 subscribers. The books that I've brought him here today are the Author Air Handbook, How to Manage an Author Estate, and the Author estate handbook, how to organize your affairs and leave a legacy. Michael has spoken at many renowned conferences. He's built a writing career while working a full-time job in insurance, raising a family, and attending law school classes in the evenings. He's now graduated from law school, and it is our privilege to have him on the Entrepreneur Secrets podcast. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Michael. Hi, Ruth. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I am so happy to have you. And uh, I mustered up the courage to invite you after I had written the, the email to invite you on the podcast, like maybe about four weeks before hearing you on Joanna Penn's podcast, because I've been working with some authors and a good friend of mine died of cancer in 2021 shortly after publishing her book we were working on it before and so we knew that it might happen and we really wanted it to be done before she passed away and so i started thinking about estate management for authors what's going to happen if she passes away and then this year i was working with another author i was his publishing coach it was the Monday, um, I got the news that he passed away and we were to send the book to the press on the Wednesday. And he passed away without a will. And I had to seek legal advice. What do I do now? And so it got me thinking, I have 27 books. <laughs> what is mm -hmm. going to happen? God forbid, if I get a diagnosis or something and I suddenly pass away, are my books going to die with me? And so I started reading up on books. And when I heard you on Jonah's podcast that I don't miss, I said, no, I, I, I need to have Michael on the podcast. So that is why you are here. But before I get into estate management for authors, fun question. Have you ever been to any Caribbean island? And what was that like? I have not been to a Caribbean island yet. I, I really want to get down there and and ex experience it. I, I have been to the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica, okay, but uh, not quite the same. Yes, it, it it's not. You need to come to Jamaica and eat some jerk chicken and experience yes. some of our beaches and sand. But I'm sure you know about our athletes. We have the fastest athletes in the world in terms of track and field. Yep. We are famous for our reggae music, so you need to um, visit. Okay, yes. so. That aside, I have a question because many persons think that when you have a family, you're going to school or they complain about not having time to write. How did you make time to write so many books? You're like a writing machine <laughs> and you have a book called Be a Writing Machine. I do. So yes. how do you do that? Yeah, well, I, I had a I had a perspective shift in 2012. So. I had gotten out of college. I was working a few years in this terrible job. I hated it. And I wanted to be a writer, but I never really knew how to do it. It's like self-publishing was around, but it still had a really big stigma. So I never thought about it. And I had a near-death experience. I, I went out to a nice dinner with my wife and I fell ill with what I thought was food poisoning. And I ended up in the hospital for a month. Mm. And I was on a lot of drugs, on a lot of um, medications 
to try to help me get better while I was in the hospital. And I was having these weird hallucinations and I got these visions of being a writer and I don't know why it happened, but I, I, it was the most, one of the most amazing things I can remember. And I remember swearing to myself that if I got better, got out of the hospital, I would become a writer no matter what. And that's exactly what I did. And right when I got out of the hospital is when I found the creative pen, ironically. Uh (laughs) (laughs) So I, 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 Uh, learned about self-publishing, jumped into it. And so I made a decision at that point that I was going to do this no matter what. And Mm. I was going to be one of the best in the world at it if I could in terms of productivity and and getting my books out to the market. And if people liked it, awesome. If they didn't, that was okay because I was going to still keep that promise to myself no matter what. And so I have molded everything around my writing. So I write on my phone. So I was just taking my wife to a doctor's appointment yesterday and the doctor was taking longer than expected. And I had to sit out in the car because of COVID protocols. And so I actually have Scrivener on my phone and I was writing my next chapter on my phone. Mm -hmm. I also dictate. So I have a little voice recorder and I Mm -hmm. can speak my words three times faster than I can type them. And so I, at minimum these days, I'm hitting anywhere between three and 5,000 words a day because of dictation. And so if there's a will, there's a way. And you get it just it just matters on how much you want to do it. And so mm-hmm. I've just put my full force in into this and haven't looked back. Okay. I love it. And when you said um through dictation you can get three thousand to five thousand words per day. People, I hope you're listening. When I tell you you can write a book in a day or in a couple of days, especially a small nonfiction book, there you have it. Because in three days, you could have 15,000 words and that's a small nonfiction book right. that can be useful and helpful. And so learn to speak your book or dictate your book. That really helps. And notice he says he writes on his phone. He also has a, a writing app, Scrivener. And so on the way to the doctor, I hope your your wife is okay. Yes, yes, she's doing fine. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, you don't have to necessarily set a time specifically to sit and uh, write. So I love that. And that explains also his decision. It begins with a strong commitment. And so weak commitment is the cause of failure. And he made a decision, come what may, I'm going to write whether I sell any books or not. And so thank you for giving us those nuggets. I have some questions on the paper because I want to make sure I ask them. So if you see me looking down, it is no, because no of, of that. Okay. So why estate planning for authors? Why do we need that? Why is that important to us? Talk to us about that a little. It's important because I would imagine that many people listening, their books are a big part of their identity. And just like family and just like friends and taking care of your loved ones when you're gone is a priority for all of us, we should also be thinking about taking care of our books. Because in today's self-publishing age, anyone can publish a book tomorrow. You know, you just talked about writing a book in a weekend. Anyone can do that now if you have the commitment and if you dedicate yourself to doing it. But when you pass away, there's all sorts of things that can happen that can make make it so that you can no longer make money from your book. And so we owe it to ourselves and to our books. If we're going to spend all this time in our chair in a room by ourselves making stuff up, we owe it to ourselves to try to give our books a fighting chance when we're gone. And we also owe it to the people that we designate as our heirs to help them figure out how to keep continue to make money from the books because – I think a lot of people have spouses or children or even grandchildren who have no idea what they do every day. (laughs) (laughs) You go into a room and the door shuts and it's a book comes out, you know, and they just don't know. And, and just imagine how over it's overwhelming to learn self-publishing. Yes. I mean, to learn how to put together a book, how to edit it, what needs to be on your cover how to format that book, where mm-hmm. to sell that book. I mean, it's, these are a lot of decisions that mm-hmm. you and I have to figure out. And it it wasn't easy for us. If your spouse doesn't know any of that, it's going to be 10 times as overwhelming mm-hmm. and it will be a burden to them. And if they see it as a burden, 
then they are not likely to continue your legacy. So we have to be thinking about ways to make it easy because at the end of the day, our books make money, which helps support our families and help support our loved ones. So we have to bring them along for the ride. That is so true. And when you talk about your nearest and dearest sometimes not having a clue what you do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I find it hard to explain. And for real, many authors themselves find the process of publishing, self-publishing daunting. And no matter, sometimes you say, for us in the Caribbean, we, we talk about publishing. We're always looking for somebody to manage the process for us. And our authors are willing to pay for that. So if the authors themselves... Uh, don't want to take on the process. <laughs> what mm -hmm. about the heirs who don't know anything about this life? And in Jamaica in particular, you own the, the copyright. You can make money after 95 years after death. And only the oh, US wow. is like 70 years. So that's a be, long yeah. time. That is a so, very long time. What do we do to ensure that the books don't die with us and that our heirs or we put systems in place to ensure that the book continues to make money and impact people like Agatha Christie's books or Ian Fleming, his yes. books are still around through the James Bond series and things like that. What can we do to ensure our books have impact and bring in income after we're gone? The most important thing you can do is figure out who is going to manage your books when mm -hmm. you're gone. Is it a spouse? Is it a child? Is it a grandchild? And then sit down with that person and tell them exactly what they're getting into. <laughs> don't surprise them. Don't, don't, don't pass away. And then, then, then they find out how much work this is going to be. You know, sit down with them and explain to them, all right, this is what I do every day. This is how I do, how I, I, I publish a book. You know, give them the overview, give them the highlights, tell them how much time it roughly spends you each week, and then make sure that they're okay with taking on that responsibility. Some may not be. Mm -hmm. And so if they, if, if, if it worries them, then you have to tailor your plans accordingly. You have to, you have to work harder to make it easier for them to do the things that you're doing today. And knowledge is power. You had mentioned that a lot of people like to pay for, to help with the process. You have to be careful with that because there are scammers out there. There are people that will take advantage of errors, especially if they don't know what's going on. And they could end up paying hundreds or even thousands of dollars for something that you could do in an afternoon, right? And, or that they could do in an afternoon if they just had the right tool or, or knew how you, you did it. So knowledge is power. That is the most important thing. Once you have that conversation, then you can start planning and then you can start building everything from there and you can reverse engineer and back into what the air is going to need. Okay. So you have to think ahead while you're alive. <laughs> yes. Who can I mentor on this journey? And Who I think is mentor teach who will be able to manage this. But what if you can't find someone? Can you find an entity who would be willing to do that? What are the pros and cons of that? Yeah, that this is a difficult question because there there aren't many people you can find right now. And the reason for that is because not enough prominent self-published authors who have mastered this current landscape have died for this to become truly an issue. I think that 10 to 15 years from now, I think you and I will be having a very different conversation. I think there will be more people who are willing to step in and help the families of deceased authors. So for right now, I unfortunately, I don't have a good answer other than there are some universities out there that can help, but you know, it's it's not probably something that would be available mm -hmm. to most people. So okay. make friends with other authors. <laughs> That's another uh, uh, <laughs> yes. suggestion. Make friends yes. with other authors who, who certainly be willing to help your family out when you're gone. Um, that would be the best option or just at least having somebody that your heirs can call. So, wow. it, you know, I, I write urban fantasy and I have a, a few, a few author friends that if something were to happen to me, my wife could give them a call and they could, they could walk her through. Okay. Here's, Here's how to resolve this problem on Amazon. 
All right. Or they could even help her out. So you don't, don't forget about your friends. You know, if you've got author friends, I'm, I'm fairly certain that they would be willing to help if you're willing to help them too. Okay. I like that. So think about your author friends, because this is something I am actively thinking about. So one of the books that I've written is about one of my alma mater, where I did my master's degree. And it's about the history of the school and the stories, graduate stories of success and the story of the founder. And I have been thinking, uh, should I try to pass that on from no? <laughs> and how do I do that? So that the, at least with that book, I could give it to this institution and say, this is yours. You can continue to benefit from it and they can manage it. And that's part of what I am seeking to pursue. But what can we do apart from the selection? No, in terms of the, 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 the friends, what else do we need to put in place? Because I saw some practical things in your book. For example, where are the books? Where are the files? Where are they mm -hmm. to be found? So talk us through that process of preparing the, the persons to be able to handle this without um, feeling overwhelmed. What are just some yeah. of the basic things that must be in place for your air management entity, you name it, to be able to carry on smoothly? The first thing is a will and or a, a trust, but we can talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. As far as the, so we'll take the legal stuff aside for a second. The hardest part about estate management is getting organized. So you, you beautifully uh, uh, alluded to where are the books? Where are the files? Where are uh, the important things that you need every day that you use to run your business? Mm -hmm. That's actually deceptively difficult to mm -hmm. organize. It's like herding cats that don't <laughs> want to be herded. Yeah. And the reason for it is because there's so many things that you don't think about. So mm -hmm. first things first, I, I secure my computer with a passcode. Mm -hmm. If you do that, does your spouse or your family, do they know the passcode? to just mm. be able to get into your writing computer, just, just to start. <laughs> if they can't access your writing computer, you got a problem. You got a problem, you know? And, and what about passwords to all the different sites where you go? Mm -hmm. That's another important thing. That's why I recommend that people use a password manager, like 1Password or LastPass, because that keeps all your passwords safe in one place. And as long as your heir has that password, they can get all, or the, the master password, they can get all your passwords. Mm -hmm. So that's another critical thing. And then just kind of basic stuff like, um, where are the book files on your computer? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in making sure that you organize those in a way that makes sense. So for example, I have a folder for every book that I publish on my computer and I have that folder organized. So I have a production folder that has the, um, the file the manuscript file. It has all of the um, the edits from my editor. I've got all of my cover drafts, the Photoshop files for the cover, the, the licenses for the fonts to the cover. I mean, everything you could think of, I put it in there and I organize it logically so that if someone had to look at that folder, they could say, oh yeah, that's where the books are. Oh, oh that's where the covers are. So stuff like that. And, and if you have a lot of books like I do, it'll take you a long time <laughs> a long time to do all of this. But if you've only got a few books, you can do it now and you can you can incorporate it into every book that you publish and then it's not a thing. Mm -hmm. So just being organized in a way that is logical, not only for you, but for your heirs. They need to be able to look at everything and in five seconds, figure out exactly what's going on. Okay. Could you help them along that process by having, there's another author I read with, um, who has a book on estate management and he talks about the 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 letter that yes. you leave so could you have instructions so even though they're there in the file and it may be logically organized to you <laughs> could you also include uh, a letter with instruction you know start here this is what this is for that kind of thing would you advise that oh absolutely and and the book you mentioned is um um, Estate Planning for Authors by M.L. Buckman. Yes. It's a, fanta it's a fantastic book and, and a, a really good book to, to, to read along with mine because it gives you some, uh, some additional perspectives. And his, 
the message of his book is to draft a letter to your heirs, as you mentioned, that explains exactly where to find things. And it addresses the organization piece because your attorneys are not going to help you with the organization piece. I absolutely advise it. I have a letter for my own family. And the only thing I would make sure that people are very careful not to do is don't leave any um, legal instructions. Don't oh. talk about what your, your wishes are. Because mm -hmm. at least in the United States, if your wishes conflict with your will, I... that can create a legal fight. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you have to be careful there and, and just make sure that the letter is a suggestion. It's a strongly worded suggestion about what to do and how to do things, but not a commandment. Okay. Let's continue about organizing because I really want to get as much as we can out of this session in terms of practical advice. So my computer is secure. I know where the books are. What about the distributors um, where my books have been published? Should that be a part of what I put in there so that my heirs know exactly which platform I have been published on? What about how do I get paid? Are those some other things that should be included in the organization? Oh, absolutely how you get paid, where you get paid, where you have accounts. I mean, little things like organizing the bookmarks in your browser so that your heirs know which book retailers you publish at is another thing that you can do to help them along. Another thing you could consider doing is creating a, what's called a master publishing file. Mm -hmm. And I have a, I, I provide a free one in the book, uh, the author estate handbook, but it, it is a Excel file that has all of the metadata or all of the information that your book contains. So the price, the title, the pseudonym, if you happen to use different author names, the series name, the series number, whether it's an ebook, whether it's an audiobook or print, I mean, you name it. Mm -hmm. It has all of that information for every book in your portfolio and you can filter it and you can sort it. And if you take the time to put that together, that will give your heirs all the information they need to know. Awesome. Here's a trick question. <laughs> what if your laptop gets stolen? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> then what? How else can they access the information or your phone? Because with two-factor verification, every time I sign into Amazon or if they suspect I, I signed from a different computer, they send me a message to say, was that you? And it's on my phone with a mm -hmm. code. How do we deal with this or prepare our ears to deal with this aspect? I love this question. This is my favorite question because <laughs> this is the this is the thing I want people to really know about. And you mentioned two-factor authentication. That's exactly it. So a lot of people get those passcodes to their phone mm -hmm. and they never think about what will happen if their phone gets disconnected. So if you mm -hmm. pass away tomorrow, one of if you if you go to, I I would I would bet you money on this. Go to Google right now, and Google state planning checklists or checklists of things to do after someone dies. <laughs> yes, and I bet you one of the first things on any list that you find will be disconnect the phone. Wow! And if the air disconnects the phone before they change over your phone number in your different accounts to to get the two factor, then they can no longer get into your accounts. Like mm -hmm. it, it is it is meant to be a foolproof way of protecting your account. So if you wow. use two-factor, be thinking about that and make sure you include that in your letter to say, here are the different accounts where I have two-factor authentication. Make sure that you change the phone number to your phone number. And that will solve the problem partially. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now you mentioned your laptop getting stolen or your laptop getting destroyed, or maybe you wake up one morning and your laptop is gone. Now, all of these things can happen while you're alive, yes. but they can also happen when you're gone. And these things can happen to your heirs. I recommend a service. It's called a uh, automatic cloud backup service. It's called Backblaze is the one I use. There are a lot of them. Carbonite is another one that um, people may have heard of. And what this does is it backs up all the files on your computer and on any external hard drive that's connected to your computer. And so that way, if your computer ever dies, you can log on to an account and then download the files immediately. So okay. if something were to happen to your computer or your hard drive, your heirs will always have access to your files. And they'll even ship you a hard drive with all your files on it if you have a really bad disaster. Awesome. I love it. Very practical. But as you said, 
I googled and started looking for yep. estate planning checklist. I have been listening to the author here and I bought the Kindle as well and oh, going yeah. through it and I even went to, to the back and I've, I've read a good portion of it and listened to it twice. But I don't recall seeing an author air checklist. Do you have a checklist that you could prepare and give away as a freebie? <laughs> or, um estate planning checklist for authors just like you said we could google and find out but just for authors do you have one of those or I did i miss I would, it in the book no no <laughs> I, I i do have a i do have a resource it's called the, the, an estate planning organizer and right, what that I is that. is it's an excel sheet that basically it is like a checklist because mm -hmm. it, it allows you to uh, fill in the blanks so you can put in all the contact information for the people mm -hmm. that your heirs need to contact. You can put in all your password information, uh, pretty much everything you can think of. It is a checklist, but I don't have a like an infographic. I actually would yeah. be happy to put that together for your audience. Yes, yes, so, I think that would be. Yeah, great. I'll do that so you could share with them. It'll be a, a, a Ruth Taylor exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much because no you see, I really want to simplify the process for authors. And like I said, I have had to be dealing with this and I really want it to be made simple. Before we conclude this, I want you to just give us a deeper dive into the two books that you have written and why you, you wrote them and why we should get them. Yes. Yeah, so the first book is called The Author Estate Handbook how to organize your affairs and leave a legacy. And that book basically holds an author's hand through the process of planning for their future. So taking the steps now while you're still alive to ensure that your books will outlive you. So we talk about wills, we talk about living wills, we talk about trusts, we talk about uh, a lot of legal stuff. And then we also go through the organization process. So, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about passwords and two-factor verification. There's a whole chapter in there that goes way in depth. We ta also talk about uh, just other things that you might not think of uh, in terms of um, simplifying things for your heirs. And this will allow you to have that conversation with your heirs so that you can start the process. All right. Now, the other book is for heirs. So it is called the Author Heir Handbook. And it is basically a simplified version of the author estate handbook, but it basically assumes that the heir knows nothing about a publishing business mm -hmm. and it holds their hand through that. Now, it doesn't give any legal advice about how to handle attorneys or courts or any disputes that could arise, but it does give them information they need to know about running a publishing business. So here is how copyright works. Here is how the author made money. Here are the places the author would have used to make money. Here are the steps of producing a book. Here are the tools you would use. Mm -hmm. Here is how you would update a book that's already been published. You know, just kind of as practical as I could make it and as concise as I could make it for the person that's taking over the, the author's business. And I can testify that it is very concise and practical. As I read through it, I'm like, He's given us a, a, a complete course on publishing. You've gone into covers, the seven steps involved in publishing. The thing is so detailed that if your heir wanted to become a publisher <laughs> and start a they business, can they can do it. So I want to congratulate you for oh, thank you. providing the information. And one of the things you said is that this book is written in plain English. <laughs> yes, plain <laughs> and English. And I loved that you've made it so practical so that I have not only listened, but I, I collated all my books and I have my folder I, I don't have the carbonite and stuff, but I made like a Google Drive thing and I contacted a friend of mine who introduced me to independent publishing and my sister. And I'm like, if anything happens to me, this is where this is at. So what I would what I would also encourage is that persons buy these two books and you can gift it to your heirs or the, the designate so that they can begin to, to understand the process. And I believe you work with the Alliance of Independent Authors. And I think it is part of what persons get when they join Ally. Can you talk to us about Ally? What is Ally? 
What is your yes. role in it? And how can Caribbean persons become a part of that? Yeah, I would love to talk about Ally. So uh, Ally stands for the Alliance of Independent Authors, and it is a nonprofit organization for self-published writers by self-published writers. And it's really, we, we like to use the term independent author because you you really don't publish by yourself. It's right. kind of a misnomer. You need a team of people, whether it be an editor or a cover designer, there are people that help you with this. So that's why we call ourselves independent authors, but we are a nonprofit organization. We are global. So we, we are open to any author on the globe. We, we started in England. So, so sometimes there's a bit of a misnomer that we're a British organization because our founders are British, but we're actually global. We're a global organization. And so we provide information to help authors make better books and sell more books. And we believe that knowledge is key. And we try to give authors the best up-to-date knowledge that exists. And we do that through a number of different things. One is we have a podcast network that uh, we have different shows every week geared toward authors. We have a, a free blog that uh, has posts daily with up-to-date information on everything you need to know about ISBNs or copyright or audiobooks for uh, audio, AI audiobooks. I mean, you name it, you know, just whatever, whatever the topic of the day is. And then we also have guidebooks that, um, that are available to our members that cover different pro parts of the publishing process, like how to get your books into bookstores, um, you name it. The, the most common questions people have about self-publishing. And so our big belief and, and the big thing that we do is just try to spread the information out there and also try to help people avoid scams. So we yeah. also have a database that's a watchdog. And if, if, if an author service does an amazing job, we'll list them as recommended in our database. If they don't do a good job and they've defrauded people or scam people, we'll let you know about that. So if you ever come across somebody and you want to know, huh, is this person legit? We have a free database. So selfpublishing.org or selfpublishingadvice.org slash ratings, check them out. And if they're not there, we can look into them for you. All right. So yes, you did mention the author estate handbook and the author air handbook. I did license those to allies. So those are now available to any ally member uh, free of charge as a part of their membership. And uh, our membership is affordable. Uh, as I said before, it's open to Caribbean authors. We would love to have Caribbean authors. Uh, we're, we're big on the diversity of thought. And the more authors we have from all over the world, the better it makes us as an organization. So uh, mm -hmm. be sure to check us out. Um, selfpublishingadvice.org. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for that because I recently started a self-publishing services company, Bamboo Sparks, who is a sponsor of this podcast. And we want to be a trusted voice in the author community for our Caribbean authors at home and in the diaspora. So we will sure be checking out the Alliance of independent authors and applying to join so that persons will see that we are legit. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I had another question on the paper that I want to ask before we close the, the, the show. And that is, what's the difference between a, a, a will and a living trust? Would you advise an author like myself or you who um, have so many books to create a living trust and should they do the living trust versus the will or can they do both? Yeah, that's a great question. So everything I'm about to say is not legal advice. It's just general overview. There is not necessarily one that is better than the other. It depends on your goals. All right. So what a the purpose of a will is to determine who gets what. So who gets the car, who gets the house, who gets your personal belongings, if you have minor children, uh, you have to have a will, at least in the United States, because that will determine who gets guardianship of your minor children as well. So there are reasons to have a will, and most people probably should have wills because they have personal property that they're going to want to have control over who gets what when they die. Because if you don't do that, then people fight over it, and you know the state has to decide who gets what. And I, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> you, you don't want the government deciding how your property gets accumulated, especially the property you've worked so hard for in your life. So that's the purpose of a will. Now you can assign your copyrights through a will. 
And, and that is something that some people do. The only downside to a will is that when you die with a will, you have to go through probate. And probate is a legal proceeding where the court will basically validate your will and make sure that your wishes are honored in accordance with the laws of your state or country. The problem with probate is that it's expensive mm -hmm. and it can take a very long time and heirs often complain that they have no control over anything. And so if you're, and, and also probate proceedings are public, at least in, in many countries. So everybody and, and their brother can see what you got, <laughs> what you died with. And I don't know, I'm not, I'm not crazy about that personally. All right. So that's why a lot of people develop what's called a living trust or a living mm -hmm. revocable trust. And what this is, is it is an instrument. It's a legal entity that holds your property. So you can put your house into a trust, your car, your copyrights, so that when you die, it's as if you didn't own it. And property that's in a trust does not have to go through probate. So therefore, you maintain some flexibility in terms of who gets what. And then you can also keep all of your property out of public records. That's a very, very fast overview of why you would want to have one. A, a trust is more expensive. It's going to cost you, at least last time I got quotes, it was about $2,500 US to get a trust. So they're not cheap to set up. But if you think about it, if you die without a will or if there's some sort of problem with your existing will, it's going to cost your family a lot more than $2,500 to get that resolved. So it's an investment in your future. And it also will ensure that you can pass your property down without having to worry about it going going to the state. Wonderful. I just want to thank you, Michael, for coming and just sharing so clearly all this information about estate planning and not making it sound gory or morbid. And it, it, it's like a light, comforting <laughs> discussion <laughs> that we've been having. And I really love that. Where can we find out about your writer's advice books? I'm especially interested in the nonfiction books, especially for those who listen to this show. So tell us a little bit more about some of those books quickly. And where can we find out more about you and contact you for more information? Yes, I have lots of books for advice for writers, pretty much everything you can think of uh, across the writing process from being more creative to finding ways to sell more books. And you can find those at authorlevelup.com. And if you're interested in the books themselves, you can find it at authorlevelup.com slash books. And they're all on that page. You can browse them and um, uh, pick which one suits you at this point in your career. Thank you so much. And uh, one of my favorite is the Indie Writers Encyclopedia. So I want to just thank you again, Michael, for coming. And we certainly will be in touch. Thank you, Ruth. It's been my pleasure.